Hi guys, Jonathan here. Welcome back to What's This Weapon? This is a bit of a fun discovery, well for me anyway. Um, it's not like the armories didn't know it was there, but I'd never looked at it. And so just going through the pistol drawers the other day, I happened to notice this absolute beast. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I don't know how I didn't notice it before, actually. It is a flintlock pistol, obviously, and it is enormous. You'll have heard the term, or some of you will have heard the term cannon barreled associated with flintlock pistols. It's just a descriptive term used by collectors and museum folk like us uh, to describe a barrel that looks a bit like a cannon. Um, you, it, well, nearly always means that it's a half stocked arrangement as well. So you have the, not only is the barrel shaped a bit like a cannon, but it overhangs the wooden stock. Before we go back to this, so this, this, this completely contradicts what I just said about <laughs> half-stocked. Um, because with this style, uh, what's known as a blunderbuss pistol, again, just a descriptive term really, I'm not sure what they would have called it in period, and we're looking at the mid-18th century here. This one has a full stock, but it has a much more classical blunderbuss style barrel. So it's a cannon-shaped barrel with stages, with these of what would be called a reinforce on a cannon. But unlike a cannon, it flares massively at the muzzle end. But the actual bore is a great deal smaller than the mouth of the barrel, the actual muzzle, as if that <laughs> makes any sense at all. So still big, you know, this is still um, musket bore, but the, the mouth is greatly flared. And that's your classical blunderbuss shaped barrel on a, on a carbine style blunderbuss, and indeed on the vast majority of blunderbuss pistols. Now uh, this is, these are both French. So before I put this one away, you can see they actually do have, they're, they're very similar in proportions, very similar shape of, of butt or of stock. It's just that the star of this particular episode is a half stock and your more classical blunderbuss pistol in this case has a, a full stop. So we'll put that one away. That one's actually a bit later, I think. That's probably, that might be very late 18th century. This one is about 1760. Uh, we date that primarily from the style of the lock. Uh, and we know again from the style of the lock and also the decoration that this is French. And if we didn't know it from those things, we'd know it from this. <laughs> which is a sort of combined royal cipher, like you'd see on a well, brown best musket lock or something, and coat of arms. So it has a royal crown with uh, fleur de lis sort of embedded within that design. And then it has three fleur de lis in a particular arrangement. And either side are very stylized foliate L's. So one's facing the right right way, one's facing the opposite way to sort of create a sort of uh, almost a shield or, or a, a container uh, for the rest of the cipher. And this is the arms, these are the arms slash this is the cipher of Louis the 15th. So that helps with the date. It also very excitingly hints that this is from a royal collection at the very least. So maybe the most obvious thing about this, this monster is its enormous bore. Um, specifically eight bore or eight gauge uh, in American. And that is uh, 0.835 of an inch. So it's 83 or 84 caliber, depending on how you want to round it. And it is 21.2 millimeters. So up to 20 millimeters um, in, in the NATO system, it's, it's usually applied to automatic or self-loading weapons. So uh, that's a machine gun. Above that, it's a cannon or an auto cannon, and that's in the light weapon class of weapons. Uh, so we can't, I suppose we can't quite call it artillery, but it does have a cannon shaped barrel. It does have the Museum of Artillery stamp on it, and it is over 20 millimeters. So you can call it a hand cannon if you like. Just don't get it confused with a medieval hand cannon, hand gun, we prefer. It's very heavy. Um, it has this sort of recurve butt shape, which you might think, oh, that's, that's for recoil control. Well, maybe, but it's also uh, a distinctive French style of the mid to late uh, 18th century. And before we get to the practical aspects of this, which are quite interesting, we have other decoration other than the cipher. We have a, a foliate, uh, well, it's sort of Rococo style. All of this is Rococo. 
So there's a, a finial on the trigger guard there. There's the decoration on the trigger guard itself. And we have on the butt cap, it is in fact a grotesque mask or maybe a lion, arguably. It almost looks like a Chinese style dragon. And that's where the butt cap screw is, is its mouth, effectively. So it's a little bit more stylized than some of the classic English silver grotesque mask butt plates, say, uh, or French for that matter. And the side plate, again, has sort of stylized foliage. It's, it's relatively plain, but in the middle, it meets the two halves meet in the middle with foliage as well. So fairly understated, but still decorated. Now, what it doesn't have well, there's a little bit of filed decoration on the frizzen spring, but there's no other decoration on the lock, and there's no name on the lock. Now, if this was for the king himself, we might expect the name to be on there, but there's no hard and fast rule with that. Um, I've no problem with the, the arms on there. Um, well, I'll, we can speculate at the end on, on, as to what the real significance of this is, but it will be speculation, I warn you now. We don't know too much more uh, about this. For me, the really interesting aspect is, uh, well, in the catalogue, when I, when I looked this up, it was down as either for firing a heavy charge of shot, which is sort of intuitively, I think, what we would expect this to be for. Um, I mean, you could shoot a giant bullet out of this thing, but um, what would be the advantage? Or it was down as maybe being a signal pistol, a flare pistol. Um, to which I might add, if it was had a royal provenance, perhaps for popping off fireworks more so than signal pistol. I mean, a, a king doesn't usually have to signal for help, and if he did, why would he use this? So I thought, right, well, can I add anything to this? Let's pop off the barrel, which, because somebody has been in and, and removed this before, the screws were relatively loose, and I was happy that I wasn't going to cause any damage by taking the barrel out and I peered down the bore, and I'll try and show you what I saw without taking it apart again, because I don't want to subject it to, to more uh, risk. One thing I saw was dirt. So <laughs> this isn't, I have not deliberately not cleaned this or asked conservation to clean it. If we were displaying it, we might. Um, then again, the exterior is fairly clean. So discuss in the comments. So there's obvious buildup of carbon in the bore. Um, of a sort that anyone who shoots black powder sort of recreationally or co for competition will recognize if, if, if you have not cleaned your, uh, your barrel, which you should, then you get this sort of, uh, well, it happens quite quickly, actually, a sort of almost a plaque of, of carbon from shooting. And then there was a lot of um, grime, essentially, like sooty grime in there. So this thing had definitely been fired at some point Um, and probably quite far in the past, because this came to us from the Museum of Artillery. Just quickly divert to show you the, the mark on the butt there. This, we've shown a version of this before. This one does have the cannon mark on it. So MA, Museum of Artillery, and the little cannon. They're destructively stamping their mark into things in the 19th century. So, yeah. Um, so if this was fired, it was probably done within its service life. We can be somewhat sure, but course some some rogue curator could have stoked it up and, and shot it as well so that's interesting in itself and as to the question of is this a flare pistol is it a real pistol for shooting actual bullets out of as it were well there's actually quite a lot of evidence so if we peer down there with a little that little orange light in there hopefully you can see well my first thought was because I put a gently put a rod down there it stopped well short of the t of the touch hole and I thought oh this is almost like a blocked barrel non-firing thing, but I knew it had carbon buildup in it, so that made no sense. Almost immediately spotted what, what this actual construction is. It's a conical powder chamber and an incredibly th thick, massive breech. So there's, I think, about 16 millimeters of solid brass from the, from the back of the barrel before any, there's any hole at all, as it were, then you get the very apex of this conical powder chamber, and then that tapers at 
maybe 30 degrees or something down to the main barrel thickness out here, which is three millimeters. So it's already a three millimeters thick brass barrel, pretty stout, and then it thickens up massively. You've got about, you've got 40 millimeters of reinforcement and 16 millimeters of that is solid brass. So this is absolutely for taking a sizable powder charge and a sizable charge, probably of shot, as I say, probably not a single massive bullet, but you could do that. So, bit of a wrist breaker, <laughs> potentially. Um, the weak point of this would be the stock. In fact, we can see there is a, a, a fairly brutal looking but old crack here at the uh, knife point or spear point. Um, no, I guess we call that a knife point tail of the lock there. Anyway, um, there's a big crack there. And with the barrel off, there's almost no wood on that side of the gun. It's been relieved so much to fit this massive chunky barrel in that it's actually lacking, lacking wood. So I don't think you'd be able to shoot this too many times before that crack would appear, at which point they may well have retired it. There's one more technical aspect to cover here, which is unusual, and you probably spotted it. It's this enormous dome-headed screw in front of the trigger guard there. So instead of a cross pin or a, a, a flat key, or some other way of retaining the barrel with a lateral retention, what they've done is drill the underside of the barrel and insert a screw. Not very far into it, because it's only a, I mean, it, it's a little bit more than three, it's about, probably about four millimeters thick at that point, because we're still at this reinforced chunky bit here. But still, drilling into the barrel to secure the stock is not usually a good idea. You're weakening that point. Um, I don't know how many charges you'd have to fire at what, at what powder charge to actually have that cause any issues. It probably wouldn't be an issue, but still, um, I was surprised to see that. So, a highly unusual bit of kit, this. Um, I guess justified by having the Royal um, Arm slash Cipher on there. And this was picked up, um, for, presumably, from one of the palaces in France in 1815 by British forces, as some of you might have guessed. Uh, given the time frame. So this is in the aftermath of Waterloo, the Napoleon's defeat, and all sorts of things getting, um, well, looted is one word, um, at the end of a you know, victorious campaign, all sorts of stuff was rounded up and taken back uh, from munitions grade stuff. So there are, there are tons of um, cuirasses, bless, breastplates, for example, uh, at the Tower of London. Some are in a frame on display to this day. And then more unusual, interesting stuff like this. And we have some other pieces from, from there, which might pop up in future, perhaps on Up in Arms, our other, our other series. But this is sort of both historically interesting and technically interesting. Now, what was Louis XV doing with this? We can't say, we don't know, um, but he had an extensive, all the Louis, I think, or most of them, had extensive collections of arms, uh, beautifully made things, sporting guns, technical, technically interesting stuff as well. I think this is the sort of desert eagle of its day. Um, pointlessly powerful, excessive, um, you know, whatever, whatever, however you want to call it, this is, this is showing off. This is absolutely showing off. Maybe, maybe Louis took it to the range and fired off a shot just every now and again, who knows? Maybe it was fired once uh, and then put away dirty and that's why it's full of dirt. But I don't know, I think it's had more use than that. Practically speaking, how would he have used it or anyone else have used it? Traditionally, one-handed, just like any other pistol, maybe with a slight, slight tilt to the wrist to help absorb the recoil. And you would probably have a similar experience. It's very hard to say. Unlike something like a modern Desert Eagle or a Magnum revolver pistol, those charges are basically set depending on the load that you, that you choose, but you, you, know, you put the cartridges in, it fires and has a predictable sort of felt recoil. This thing, that powder chamber, I don't know, three drams or something, half a musket charge, that's significant with a one-handed weapon, even with this, this hefty weight to help manage that recoil. And I can see this um, really making your wrist ache and, and pivoting up probably quite a bit as well. Could you use two hands on it? Well, you could. Um, you could even hold it out here if you wanted to. That, that would, you know, more like a sawn-off shotgun. Some people would, well, 
sort of the by default how you have to hold a sawn off shotgun. Anything goes, basically. There are no rules <laughs> applying here. This is not a military bit of kit. Who knows, basically. You let your imagination run wild, but we know it's from the French Royal Collection of the day. We know it's a an eight bore muzzle. Very likely for shot, like buckshot size shot, probably what they, what they used to call small shot or pistol balls. You, you could have a stack of pistol balls in here. They could be made up into a paper cartridge ahead of time with a powder a powder charge. But given the, sh the conical shape of the breech, I doubt it. I think this was for loose powder. And then probably a, an arrangement of shot in a packet that you then push down. I haven't mentioned ramming. Well, there is no provision for a ramrod. And amusingly, the bore is just so big that you probably just poured in the powder and pushed in <laughs> your <laughs> packet of shot or poured in a loose amount of shot and then just a bit of wadding in the end. All of these methods would work. And uh, I'm very curious to know what it's like to shoot it, but this is the only one we have. It's too far too precious to shoot. So unless someone wants to make a replica, um, we'll just have to speculate. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. Um, as always, you can play along over on Facebook or Instagram, guessing what it is that we're going to end up revealing on the video series. Or we can just carry on watching just the videos. We don't really mind which you do. Uh, also, check out our website, um, any events that we happen to, to have coming up. At the moment, the main thing is our exhibition Reloaded, which is a temporary exhibition featuring decorated firearms of, well, all eras really, but there's some, some pretty Pretty interesting stuff in there. Gold-plated Kalashnikov. Uh, there's a gold sterling as well, for those of you who aren't so interested in the uh, AK side of things. The Art Deco Baby Browning that we covered the other, the other week on the channel, and a lot more besides. So please do come and check that out. It's on until the end of June. That's if you're in the UK, of course. In any case, we thank you again for watching the series, and we'll see you again next week.